return to your seats, please join us and stand in reverence for the reading of God's Word. Be finding in your Bible the second chapter of the book of Revelation. Second chapter, book of Revelation. As we continue, as the Lord gives leadership on God's message to the church. God, now, uh, church, now let's just, let's just follow along here. If he's got a message for us, we ought to want to hear it. And then be obedient in those things. Find Revelation chapter number 2 and then mark verse number 8 with your finger. And here we'll go reading there. Revelation chapter 2 verse number 8. What the Bible says. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. That's a reading of God's word and everybody said, God, we love you and thank you for your holy word because in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And when we dive in your word, it draws us closer to you. Now, Lord, you preach today and Lord, we pray thy will be done. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Thank you and be seated. A message to the church reminding you back in Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 1, the Bible begins by saying this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. By the way, you've had church when you can go home after church and say, we uplifted the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we heard from the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a revelation. We want to be uh, in a place where he is revealing himself to us. And he is moving in a great and mighty way. And when we look in that again, we said every week that we'll do this, we'll mention as introductory these few things we need to understand in verse number 20 uh, of Revelation chapter number one. Also, as it tells us there, that the mystery of the seven stars that saw us in the right hand and the seven golden can candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the churches and the candlesticks, seven candlesticks, thou sawest are the seven churches. There's application. Of course, as this is, uh, vision is given, it applies to these local churches that are specifically mentioned. It applies to all churches of all ages to uh, give an account of the spiritual state of those churches. There is personal exhortation, he that hear and him that overcometh. And then fourthly, it is prophecy and it is phases of the church history. So last week we looked at the church of Ephesus. It was in a sense a general church uh, message, if you will, the status of the church and what's going on there. And today we're going to look at the church of Smyrna. And when we look in Revelation chapter 2 verses 8 through 11, Smyrna, if you will, highlights a time of great persecution uh, towards the church. Now I remind you, we feel persecuted in today's world, but compared to the things that Smyrna had gone through uh, in our historical sense, uh, we've not begun to touch the level of persecutions uh, that they went through. Hey listen, we spend a a great deal of time begging people, imploring people, exhorting people, pleading with people to live for Jesus. But listen, if you're not ready to live for him, I'm certain we're not ready to die for him. We need to be ready, church, in this day and age. And Smyrna here has something that we need to understand. First of all, in verse number eight, uh, it is unto the angel at the church. And as we looked at, that would be uh, symbolic or metaphorically speaking to the uh, ministers that were there overseeing that. The message is going to those folks so that they can then in turn share with the church and those kind of things. Now we need to understand that we have, sometimes we get out of the way. Listen, God speaks to you. You don't need a a priest, a pope, or anybody else, you need to have a relationship with Jesus. And everybody saying, but there are some messages God only sends the church through the man of God that he sends the church. And we need to understand in a real sense, that's why it didn't say in verse eight, he sent it to the whole church. He said, I'm sending it to the angel of the church. 
And the angel, the minister of the church was supposed to tell that. That's why I would covet your prayers every week because listen, all preachers that I know of, we all got our own message every Sunday because we'd like to tell this row something and this section something and the balcony something and we'd like, we all got our own message but it's really important we make sure we do God's message. Verse number eight, we see there that God speaks to his messenger, his minister, the angel at the church to speak to his church through that man. And then let's look at what he says. Just as the Lord knew the works of Ephesus, he knew the works and knows the works of Bethel. He knows the works of Smyrna. He knew, you remember last week God just got all over me and we spent several minutes there when he just said simply, I know thy works. And if he knew Ephesus, he knows Smyrna. And if he knew Ephesus and he knows Smyrna, he knows Shane and he knows you and he knows you all and he knows us together. And when we look here in Revelation chapter number two, we can see something in verse number nine. We see he says, I know thy works. Now, that's really important because if you go back to verse number eight, the last part, notice he takes for this church on an additional title. Uh, if you notice, he adds a title, if you will. He adds, a, he wants to remind you, who is it? It says, this is the first and the last. Uh, he's the beginning and the end. He is the alpha and he is the omega. Uh, God is, everything found in God is found in his son, Jesus Christ. And that's the first and the last. Hey, listen, I don't know about you. I may go and I may try to buy a car before too many more days. It's either, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and I'm not a mechanic. So I may seek out some of you all that have mechanical expertise if I go to buy a used car. But here's the one person I know I'm not going to go ask is the person that is as clueless about those things as I am. <laughs> I had a cousin that's filed for bankruptcy three or four times. And that cousin called me one time and said, yeah, I've gone to the pastor. I want to do a financial class at church for people. <laughs> I said, boy, that'll be a blessing. I'm sure your pastor will enjoy that. I'm not going to, we're going to go on. He said, I am the first and the last. Where else are you going to go? Where are you going to get a better answer? Where are you going to get anything any more true? Where are you going to get anything more accurate? Hey, by the way, I, I want the Lord to be in charge of any stock market adventure I have because he knows when it's crashing. He knows why it's going to go and, uh, and all those kind of things. I mean, now I'm not saying like a, a Aladdin's lamp kind of thing. What I'm telling you is he's the final authority. So when we get a message from God, what are we waiting on? And in verse number eight, he says the first and the last. Notice this. Oh, by the way, he's also the one that was dead, but now is alive. Mm. Ain't nobody else can claim that. Now, somebody, some of you uh, want to split theological and say, well, Lazarus can say that. Yeah, but Lazarus needed this one to raise him. This one did it all by himself. That makes him worth listening to. Now, let's go to verse 9. Because the first and the last, I think, has got something to say to Shane today, and maybe he's got something to say to you. I think the one that was dead and is now alive has got something to say to me today, and I hope he's got something to say to you. And in verse number nine, he says, I know thy works and tribulation and your poverty. Oh, he lays it out there for him. He says, I know what's going on down there. Hey, you know, now keep in mind, Smyrna was a time of persecutions, as we've already said. Everybody say persecutions. One, two, three. Here's what he just said. I know you're hurting. I know you're being tormented. I don't know about you, but it just helps my, me to know when I'm in a bad time, Jesus knows I'm hurting. It just helps me to know he takes note of me hurting. Now, by the way, sometimes it just helps me know this too, that he said he ain't ever gonna leave me, nor forsake me. When we look in verse nine, Jesus here says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. Jesus knows what they were going through. Now, by the way, for him. What they were going through for him. And they were going through those things for him. Uh, a lot of times, every time, now we gotta be careful. We don't be like average Christians. Everybody said amen. amen. We don't be like average Christians. We wanna actually please the Lord with things that we do. 
And there's lots of folks, not here, but them churches in West Tennessee, there's lots of folks that when anything bad happens, they assume it's because of their goodness and their righteousness. See, y'all don't understand it because it ain't here, it's somewhere else. <laughs> oh, it's happening to me. The devil's after me. Uh-uh. Sometimes something bad might be happening to you because God's trying to get your attention. That's why you gotta back up and pray and say, oh Lord God, am I where you want me to be in this thing? Something bad might be happening to Shane because Shane messed up and Shane made bad choices. But there are also times that the devil is trying to really get us. Smyrna is in the middle of great persecutions. By the way, you can say what you want to, but when I get in everybody's wallet, by the way, that's thick and they ain't but $4 in it. That's <laughs> Correction. There's two receipts. There ain't nothing in it. <laughs> Jimmy, that's just credit cards, man. <laughs> Smyrna was known for their merchants, their trade, their wealth. And in the middle of that situation, God had set the church of Smyrna down right there and it was flourishing. But then all of a sudden, they turned their attention to something else. What God might have blessed them with all of a sudden become their main desire. And when that became their main desire, like Ephesus, maybe they also left their first love. And as they left their first love, then what was being now loved brought in something else. See, they had done great work. Don't get me wrong. By the way, somebody at church, I need those receipts. Don't let me forget this. <laughs> they had been doing good stuff for the Lord. Hey, how many of you can say we're thankful that we go to church at Bethel Baptist Church? We're thankful for somebody landed on God's heart in 17 whatever, uh, back when Billy Ray was a sophomore in high school uh, in 1700s, whatever year that was to say we're going to get together as a group of born again believers at that little place in uh, East Tennessee and began a church and they didn't know what was going to happen they just knew they were doing what God said you know what's going to happen next week I don't either but I'm just going to trust the Lord Amen. and there's been some good things that go on but then all of a sudden there can be some persecutions too and Smyrna's sitting there in the midst of all of that going on and in the midst of having this church and the influence and it's a place known for its trade and merchants and wealth historically and guess what? All of a sudden now they're being persecuted for what they're doing for Jesus because new has come in. The persecutions even get to the point of destroying different things. It destroyed them financially. That's why he says, look in verse 9, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty because there's folks that are still trying to serve the Lord there that are now being financially penalized because they're going to try to stay faithful to the Lord I just described some things that we could look around America today and say you know what that's still going on right here right now. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. He said, I know thy works, I know your tribulation, I know thy poverty. Now look in verse number nine as we continue on there because it's important you understand that Smyrna was a place of merchants, trade, wealth, and it had a reputation of being known for all of those things, but it also had a reputation of being known for its Christian church. But now it's being overrun. It's being overrun with Mahometism. Now, I said that like that, so it's phonetically like that. If you want to write it down, you can look it up. M-A-H-O-M-E-D-I-S-M. M-A-H-O-M-E-D-I-S-M. Mayo medism. Or if you want to say it another way, it's an alternate form of Mohammedism. Here you've got a church doing something for the Lord and all of a sudden uh, it's this booming prosperous place and in this prosperous place you've got this great thriving church and all of a sudden the devil hits it right in the mouth because you've got another group 
trying to lay hold on what is currently land claimed by, figuratively, the born-again Christian church. I know thy works, thy tribulation, all these persecutions, even your poverty. Now, by the way, I don't know about you, but there's a reason there's a song, God on the Mountain is still God in the valley. Because I've had times when I could pay the bills and then I've had children. (laughs) And now we're trying to pay them by, I won't even tell you. Can I take just a moment here now? You still with me, say amen? Elias came in to me the other day and oh, bless his heart, he was so cute. He sat down right beside me on the couch He said, Dad, I need to talk to you. Now, Elias got saved last year. He just got baptized. I'm thinking, all right, here we go. This is something spiritual. He sat down right beside me, and he said, I got a a question for you. I said, okay, son, what is it? He said, can we sell Hattie? (laughs) Hattie, you don't want to know the conversation we had. We're considering it, honey. All right, now. But isn't that us today? Listen to me very carefully. I'm not just trying to be silly. We gonna sell something to get what we want. The important thing is to want what God wants so we don't sell the wrong thing. We ain't gonna sell you, honey. It's Lily Beth. All right, now, (laughs) isn't that us though? And listen, if God and his perfect divine will and his son Jesus Christ aren't the most important things to us, You know what we'll end up selling? We'll end up selling out. Now, I want us to be sold out. Now, ladies, y'all know what sold out means more than us men do, to be honest with you. You go to the store, you're really looking forward to getting something. In my wife's case, it'd probably be a pair of shoes. And guess what? You really got your heart's desire on it, you're looking forward to it, and you get in there, and all of a sudden you get there, and there's a sign that says sold out, no more. That ain't the kind of sold out. We all need to be sold out for the Lord. There's no more to give because he's got everything we got. Amen? Amen. That ain't what we're talking about. We're talking about the sold out kind. When We're talking about the Judas Iscariot kind. No, I want this more than I want Jesus. So we'll just sell Jesus so I can get what I want. Now, I know that doesn't happen here, but it happens a lot of places. And I want you to be brave enough to say, Lord, am I selling you out? Or am I sold out? Now, if that makes sense, amen. amen. And there we sit in the middle. Smyrna sits in the middle of all this prosperity. The church at one point in time was the most influential thing in the city. And now you've got this competition, if you will, and you've got this group. Now, look in verse number nine. Now, you still with me? Say amen. amen. Now, look, it says in the middle of verse nine, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, look, we're not going to get into the deep depth of that, but let me just say this. What Jesus is saying there, he knows even some of his own chosen people that say they are after him, but they're really not. He's telling the Smyrna, just like I know there's Jews who I love that say they want me, but they really don't, you need to know, just like I've set you down in Smyrna to make a difference, the devil's setting some folks down to also try to get you off track. Hey, you teenagers, sometimes that person, the devil, is sitting down to get you off track is that thing that looks cute in jeans. That should have got a few amens. Sometimes that thing that the devil's sending you to get off track comes in a bottle. Sometimes you can roll it up. Sometimes you can pop it in your mouth. Sometimes it might even be that. Wonder what job God would have you to have. Don't choose your career based on how much money you're going to make. Choose your job on where God wants you to work and minister to people around you. And by the way, last time I looked on the Forbes 500 list, missionaries didn't make a list as the highest paid people. Ah, but one day they'll have a reward if they stay faithful. You may not be in heaven's you know, if you turn over to Hebrews chapter, I hadn't planned on saying this. Thank you for giving me permission to. You still with me? Say amen. I love Hebrews chapter 11. It's known as the great what chapter? 
faith chapter. Everybody say faith chapter one, two, three. And it lists all those and it lists all these people that are in what we'd call the hero, the hall of fame for faith. But then about verse number 38 in Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says there were others. I don't mind being another. I can be another because it said of whom the world is not worthy. <laughs> Woo, that's good. I'll preach that somewhere where they get an amen. Uh, we always think of these great heroes of the faith, but then God ain't forgetting those that may not make the history books. And God ain't forgetting those that have been faithful in little country churches and been faithful in their classrooms and in their assembly lines and in their day work. God ain't forgetting those people that tell people about Jesus. There's others of whom the world was not worthy that were killed for Jesus' name. And Smyrna sat down in the middle of this and they're seeing exactly what we have seen in our own society where, uh, uh, if you will, the church used to be, hey, when some of you were in school, do you remember when it was okay uh, to, to pray in school and to you even might even have Bible teachers and Bible verses and the expected code of conduct was based on Judeo-Christian principles of behaviors and all those kind of things. And may I go a step further? It was okay and promoted to stand and salute the American flag and say we're grateful to live in one nation under God and all that's under attack well we got more in common with Smyrna than we realize don't we verse number 9 Jesus tells them I understand my own people say they're after me and reject me he says I understand what it's like to all of a sudden go from being the centerpiece of the influence in your community to now you're being persecuted for your faith he's encouraging them once a thriving church in the society now persecuted for what once was the sense of pride and effort boy that sounds a lot like America today church listen to this write this one down Jesus takes notes of the pains of the persecutions, of the bruises, of the bumps, of the heartaches you'll suffer for his name. You're hurting? Church, I want you to hear me clearly today. He knows that. If you're going through a difficult day, you're persecuted at work, you're persecuted somewhere, he knows that. One day he'll pay back those that did it to you. But the bad part is we shouldn't be looking forward to that. We should be praying that they would be forgiven and come into a right relationship with Jesus. But boy, that's tough sometimes. I don't know about you. I've had people hurt me before. And I'm not naive. I've hurt people. If I've hurt people, may it be because they were pierced by the word of God and not because I was in the flesh. I've been to bullseye before of lies, of persecutions. You probably have to. Smyrna is set down in the middle of that and then Jesus gives them, if you will, a declaration. If you look at that very clearly, here it comes. Look in verse number 10. In verse number 10, he says, Fear none of those things he says fear none of those things that you shall suffer now we will look at that here in just a moment just as he takes note of all of our pains and our sorrows and all of those kind of things we also can take note that we are to be if you uh, uh, another declaration we just shouldn't be worried about that because notice what else he notices now you're still with me say amen Look in verse 9. He says, I know thy works, tribulation, and poverty. He knows that. But notice what else he's noticed. But I've noticed you're rich. Here's what he's saying. I noticed that you might be in physical poverty, but you got some spiritual richness going on. He might be saying, you might be persecuted, but you are spiritually rich. In other words, he realizes and acknowledges you're going through a lot of temporal stuff for me, but what matters is still on track with me. Just like he sees the pain you're going through physically, he knows where you are spiritually. 
He knows today my own heart. He knows if I was just saying the words or if I was singing to him and meant what I said. By the way, sometimes you can sing loud and with a smile and still not worship the Lord. God sees those things. Sonny, you know how I know that? Because he said, I know thy works. Verse number 10, then, we look at something. He doesn't remove the persecution. Church, I'd love to tell you today, God sent me the message today and laid on my heart to come tell you no more problems. Now, I can, I can, I can show you a group of Bethel members that don't have problems. Just follow me down that hallway and we'll go out there and stand in that graveyard. They don't have any more earthly problems. But as long as we got breath and life, we're going to have earthly problems. Shane, I don't know about that. That's not real popular. Well, you know, that's why the world don't really like Jesus because he didn't preach the messages they like. Because he said man's days are not going to be that long and they are what? Full of trouble. And in chapter 2 and verse 10, look what it says. Fear none of those things which thou, look at this, shalt suffer. Not that you have suffered. Here's what he just told them. Hey, hang in there. There's more bad stuff to come. What a prosperity preacher. He said right there, he said, fear none of those things which thou shall, going forward, suffer. But verse 9 reminds us he knows we hurt. And he knows if we stay faithful spiritually. Now, if that makes sense, say amen. amen. Now, look very carefully. He doesn't remove the persecution, but he warns them, if you will, of the future. Now, look in verse 10, what else it says. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. What a blessing. Hey, listen, it's a natural progression. The older you get, and by the way, you all are exactly one week older than you were last week when I saw you. Some of you aged two weeks in that time, but you're one week older. And everybody say it? Spiritually, though, some of you that have more experience, this world seems to be a much more blatantly evil place than it was when you were kids. So now look around the room. Young adults. Children, students, what's it going to look like when they're your age if the Lord tarries? That's why we can't with our children, our young adults, our students and those things, we can't wait till they get older to be pouring the word of God into them. They need it now. Here's why. Look at this. Verse number nine. I know thy works. Tribulation. And poverty. Everybody say poverty. One, two, three. Poverty. Then in verse 10, he says, it's not only going to make you be poor, but your poverty may go to prison. The intensity of the persecution is going to increase until the Lord comes back. Young people and anybody under the age of 200, we have to bolster our faith Pray for strength. Pray for guidance. And saturate ourselves with the Word of God. Why? Because it's going to get hotter and more intense on those that will stay faithful to Jesus' name. Verse 9, they've taken and infected your livelihood. By verse 10, they're going to put you in prison. Go on in verse number 10. I want to show you something right there. By the way, there will always be a succession, if you will, of troubles in this world. Because just like God is working in your life, I trust, people don't just get stirred up to persecute the church. That's the devil stirring his crowd. You say, well, wait a minute, preacher. Now, wait a minute. That's kind of hard to swallow because I know some people that... da 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 Well, I know some people too. By the way, I know the man that created them. And he warns us against it. Wax worse and worse. You say, are you saying everybody's lost de demon possessed? No. By the way, I know some Christians that can be demonically influenced, but not possessed. 
Do you believe preacher in demonic possession? Yes. Known too many Baptists too long. Amen. <laughs> Biblically speaking, a born again believer cannot be possessed because the devil would have to cross the blood that's been applied. And if the devil crossed the blood, he'd be saved. And I've read it, he never gets saved. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. However, the devil can still influence us. You remember, we looked a few weeks back at the good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Boy, it's a whole lot easier to listen to the devil's voice if I'm not in the perfect will of God. Or if I've neglected the word in prayer time. But yes, you listen very carefully. Why do we pray for those people? Because those without a relationship with Christ are certainly at a minimum going to be influenced by the devil's voice, but they are in grave danger of being possessed by the devil. Not popular doctrine, but biblically accurate. When we look in verse number 10, it says there's going to be some of you put in jail. Now, I want to say something about there, about that real quick. The persecution, though, look at it. It is not universal. Not everybody's going to be put in jail. You know why? Because if we put this row, if we put this whole section in jail, the devil knows that that'd create enough fear and terror in this section that about half of us would tuck tail and run anyways. But then the Bible also, man, I hadn't planned on any of this. Ever since I got rid of them receipts, I just laid them at the altar of God. I know <laughs> he's probably a deacon going to pay for them. That's what that is. Amen. <laughs> I'd have brought different receipts because I just think that's two gas receipts, Stan, if I'd have known that. Amen. But the Bible always talks about there's a remnant that God leaves. So we may arrest this section and these two cowardly run. Ah, oh, but there's going to be a remnant somewhere that God's going to leave it's going to be faithful to him hey listen there's going to be some persecuted there's going to be some die the persecution may be universal but the imprisonment may not be in verse 10 because notice what it said now you still with me say amen. amen by the way all the deacons went into a time of prayer when I said that about those receipts look in verse 10 it says behold the devil shall cast some of you everybody say some of you one two three you. not everybody going to go to prison but if I put that section in prison, I'm doing the devil's work for Jesus' name. Boy, it'll really reveal who's willing to go to Jesus or to the sickle for Jesus. As we begin 2020, China has increased its harshness, its brutality, its persecutions against religious groups and specifically Christians not the only country it's the only one that made the news lately when we look in verse number 10 not everybody's going to go to prison but it says some of you so the persecution will be universal to the church but not imprisonment but it has a set time I got good news it's not forever look what the Bible says the Bible's always right and everybody said Amen. it says some of you into prison that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation 10 days The persecution may also be temporary. You say, well, somebody may die in prison. Well, they may. But the point of the message to Smyrna is you're going to continue to be persecuted. And as you're persecuted, not every one of you is going to go to jail and the ones of you that go ain't going to be there forever. And then thirdly right there, what else it says? It's going to try you, but it ain't going to destroy you. Maybe that's where we get to saying whatever doesn't kill you makes you you've heard that too. But I want you to look at the end of verse number 10. The Bible's always right and everybody's saying be thou faithful unto death. The encouragement is there. Be faithful unto death. Look why it says that. And I will give thee a crown of life. Hey, whoo, I'm looking forward to that. Now listen, 
Why does that really mean something to Smyrna? Because Smyrna was in a prosperous area and all of a sudden they've, they're impoverished, they're in poverty. And isn't it just how good our God is that he'll say the, de the world, the devil's agents may make you poor, but I'm going to give you a crown one day. That was good. You should have said amen. Uh, and not only that, not just a crown, but it's a crown what? Of life. Notice what it says right there, what it really says in verse number 10 at the end. The assurance. It's a sure thing. He said, I will give thee. The other part of that is it's a, if you will, it, it, it is suitable for what's going on. You've been impoverished and we're going to give you a crown. Some of you have even been killed, but guess what? I'm going to give you life. When we look in verse number 10 there as we begin to close this morning. Smyrna looks so much like the New Testament church, maybe even in our own back door of, of America. My father-in-law that y'all heard a couple of weeks ago has shared with me before a theory, uh, and it took him about a week to do it. I've told y'all before, he's the only man I've ever ridden with. He only told one story all the way from here to Myrtle Beach. You know, hey, if y'all think I'm long-winded, just think what I'd be if I didn't talk fast. <laughs> You'd tell everybody when you left for morning, I hope to see you tomorrow. Amen? <laughs> but let me tell you what he said. He said, could it be that the Lord brought America? Because by the way, you know, I've read this book. I don't really see America in it when you get over here towards Revelation. He said, could it be that God allowed America to rise up in the history of world history to be that light on a hill to the world around us because there's been no other country that's done Christian work worldwide like the United States of America. He said, could it be that God allowed that country to come up for a season right here before the Lord comes back? Could it be the Lord allowed America to rise to that money and all the stuff? Now, America's had some deep, dark days just like everybody else that's walked on the planet. And everybody said? But could it be that he blessed them to be the richest nation on the world for a season? Because when we were at the height of all of those things, we were sending missionaries around the world. No other nation has been founded on those Judeo-Christian principles father-in-law is a smart man he's a studied man he knows what a blessing he's got in his son-in-law <laughs> probably his other one not me but he knows amen <laughs> he's smart he's a studier he's a thinker and that thought weighs some merit in our own hearts do we know the answer no but boy it sure does seem to make sense and as we look in verse number 10 we see that a crown of life to a group that used to have money and influence and be affluent sounds awful good to a group that now is persecuted for what once was their banner of honor I want you to look in verse number 11 as we close today you still with me? Say amen. There is a call to universal attention. Who needs to pay attention to the church at Smyrna? All of us. Look at your neighbor and say, you do right now. Well, good. I didn't hear anybody smack somebody, so that's good. Hey, listen. In verse number 11, it's a call to universal attention. I need this, and I think you do too. He says, he that hath an ear let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Plural. Catch that. We don't get to pick and choose when we leave church the next five weeks and last week and today. It's not like we can say, you know what, I think I'm going to listen to the church at Ephesus and the church at Laodicea. And then you all need to listen to the rest of them. We're to listen to the message for the churches. Because God said so and everybody said it. Now look at this final promise. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. <laughs> you know why? Because if you get on over there in the book of Revelation a little bit, let me tell you some order of things. There's going to be a first resurrection. 
and it happens before the second death. <laughs> By the way, as born again Christians, sometimes we say clumsy words. I know y'all don't, but I do. And churches in West Tennessee do. So listen. So you ever heard somebody say, hey, God will have to sort that out at the great white throne judgment. Listen. Mm -mm. The great white throne judgment will have no born again believers there. That's the judgment of the lost, not the judgment of the saved. Now, if that makes sense, say amen. amen. Now, listen, Adrian, that great theologian, Adrian Rogers, says, hey, if a man's born but once, he'll die twice. But if he's born twice, he'll die but once. You know why? Because the day I got born again, it wiped out. It ain't even possible anymore for me to die twice. Yeah, I'll lay this fat body down one day. Hey, it's going to come to the side, and I'm going to lay it down should the Lord tarry. But when it comes time for that second death, the eternal uh, uh, condemnation or the judgment of the world of the lost, I won't even be there because the first resurrection will already have taken place. I won't be part of that. And what he tells that church is, I know what you've been through. I know your poverty. I know your tribulation. I know there's people out to get you. I know there's stink stirrers around, and they're trying to get you off track. He said, hang in there and be faithful because what you're going to be part of, you may not be rich here anymore, but you can have spiritual influence forever. And the life that you touch today may also be saved and he said you just keep right on doing what you're doing for the Lord Jesus Christ and one day that first resurrection is going to go that way and that second death's going to go another and he said you don't have to worry about that you won't have to be part of the second death aren't you glad for Jesus Christ 